freaking first cut. Golly! Welcome to the First Cut Podcast. I'm Rick Gaiman, and this is your RSM Classic Tournament Recap. Joining me to break it all down, Greg Ducharme is here. Hey, Greg. Well, it wasn't very interesting today. I mean, Friday night we talked about the Robert Streb runaway, and it, it happened. So, uh, it, yeah, it was nice to watch, but a, a great performance by him. You gave this victory to Robert Streb on Friday night, and it was a piece of cake the whole way. He had it in the bag. You're right. There was nothing to worry about. Stress-free. Uh, yeah, so it was, it was nice. I love it. Mark Immelman is here. Mark, happy Sunday. Thanks, boys. How are you guys doing? It's good to be back. Good to have you back. Kyle Porter also here. Looks like you're getting more and more comfortable, KP, in the new digs. Things are things are happening behind you. Yeah, I think about the 2021 Masters will be all set up. So I'm, uh, one, we're taking it one day at a time, you know, one shot at a time. So we're, 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 uh, we're making it. Uh, 2020 Mas- 2021 Masters, it looks like you've been in the pre- patron's merchandising shop there by your headgear, bro. For sure. I have. Ready for the winter. Yes. If you're watching us on YouTube, youtube.com slash first cut podcast, KP rocking the masters beanie with um bowl on top. What's that called? I don't know. Pom-pom. Pom-pom. Pom-pom on top. Uh, thank you, Greg. Robert Streb, your winner of the 2020 RSM Classic. He does it in pretty styling fashion in a playoff over Kevin Kisner. Greg, since we, we talked a lot about this uh, Friday evening, let's start here with you. Uh, this is Streb's uh, 165th PGA Tour start since he won this event in 2014, and he's now the first player to capture his first two tour victories at the same event since Daniel Berger. Which is... Uh which is great. But this is what we were talking about on Friday night, right? You, when you get all that work done early in the early goings of a tournament and you shoot 65, 63, just go, go through winners on the PGA tour and the scores that they shoot. And sometimes the order we get kind of um, sucked into the order, but you have a 65, 63 and two other rounds that are 68 or better. And the, that's a, that's a winning scorecard very often. So when you when you get that work done early, it sometimes you can feel like you're hanging on. That's the the challenge when everybody else is making their their late runs. But he didn't really have to go crazy over the weekend, which was nice. And on a day like uh, like Sunday, where there's not a lot of wind, it was a much easier golf course. If you look at the leaderboard, there's a number of um, of great rounds going on. And he didn't have to do too much. It got really close at the end. The bogey on 13 didn't help, but um, but when it when it really came down to it, he had that shot on 17. That shot was so good, uh, and and the putt was equally as good. So it was quite impressive. Yeah, par uh, par three seventeenth. He hits his shot to 11 feet, com- converts the putt mark, and and I think it's interesting because Greg was mentioning, you know, he didn't have to do a lot on the weekend, which is good because he. He didn't really. He was like five under on the weekend, 19 under in total. But this is a stat that I thought was very interesting. He's the fifth consecutive player to convert a 36-hole lead or co-lead into victory at the RSM Classic, which is kind of surprising because we see two- and three-shot leads evaporate constantly on the PGA Tour. Well, it was almost uh, almost evaporated over the final few holes this afternoon for Streb, and he came through with a few clutch shots. You know that 14th hole... I joked with you guys earlier this week when we had that text chain going on that it's one of my favorites on tour because, look, Sea Island is fantastic. That Those two golf courses, especially now the plantation was redone, it's great. But Seaside is just awesome. And the conditions there are, are always, they're always going to challenge every part of the game. And I love the golf course. And, and and 14 is one you've got to get by. And it was a bit scrappy up to then. There was that two-sided miss yet going on. And, and they hit two quality shots there. And then, of course, that birdie on 17. And to your to that statistic you level, um, it's kind of what the PGA Tour represents. You know, it's a it's a seventy two hole deal, and and really, you know, to use a cliche, over the final nine holes where the stuff starts really hitting the fan. But it was curious because as I was watching this and watching Streb, who hadn't been he'd been a non factor basically for since he won here last. Um, that was back in my radio days that I used to cover this event, 
And it always seemed like there was a playoff every year. I mean, one year with Mackenzie Hughes, we had to stay overnight because we ran out of lights. <laughs> came back the following morning in the frigid cold for one hole, basically. Um, but Streb, when he won back there, they're in a playoff. It ended on 17. And he flushed an eight iron to about three feet, right in over the top of the flag. And so when I watched him do that on 18 today, it was kind of strange how he finished off this event the same way in the two goes he's been in playoffs over here. So, so I think a lot of it is the golf course. You know, a lot of it is, you know, kind of the low ball he hits around winter conditions over there, but you could see it meant something because he was, he was kind of iffy over the final few holes, but showed his metal to come through with a victory. He, he certainly did the shot. He hit in the 17. We talked about, he gave himself a great chance on 18 to win it outright. Then he gets into a playoff KP. And I'll tell you what, you know, I, I had forgotten what Kevin Kisner's playoff record was, which we'll talk about in a second. It's kind of surprising for a guy who's so good in match play. Um, and I'm thinking, Oh man, Streb's about to get chewed up and, and spit out here by Kevin Kisner. Who's on a roll. He shoots a 63 on Sunday. Um, they, they get through the first playoff hole, both of them making par and then uh, they both miss the fairway on the second playoff hole and Streb goes first and hits. How would you describe this shot that he hits into the second playoff hole? I mean, it, it reminded me of who was it that made the ace to win uh, Shriners? Like two Jonathan Bird. Was it Jonathan Bird? Uh-huh. Yeah. That's what it reminded me of because he yeah. made it. And uh, yeah, it was, you know, I, I think, when I think about winning like he did, it's uh, and, and I think Mark has talked about this. It's almost harder when you're trying to like because somebody's going to go out shoot eight under, seven under, and you, so you know that's going to happen. And so you, you're almost saying to yourself, okay, well I have to. I, I it's just it's just a, it, it's very difficult to lead out in front like that. Uh, and so even maybe to get into a playoff might have been a relief for him of just like okay, I can breathe. Uh, I, I know it's just me and one other guy. Like we can, we can kind of get after it. But yeah, that second shot he hit in uh, to win it in the playoff was uh, was unbelievable. You know, Kyle, that's uh, an interesting point because I, I had a chance to speak with Webb Simpson back in during um, during the quarantine, and he had a very similar playoff record where it was really hard for him, and he lost at this event in a playoff. And he wow. said the same thing he uh, to Tyler Duncan last year. He said, I, I felt like when I was getting into playoffs, I felt like I could breathe. And it was, right. okay, I'm either first or second, no matter what happens. Hmm. Like, it's okay. All the work is done. And when he got to um, – when he before waste management, he was thinking about that, trying to figure out what to do, and he did some work, and he figured out he needed to be more aggressive, um, a little more urgent. And when he did that, he went out and birdied the first playoff hole at the waste management. But – I just want to, I, I was just looking at some of these uh, playoff, the playoff record of Kevin Kisner. And it's he, in 2015, RBC heritage loses to a birdie from Jim Furyk, the players championship in 2015. We remember what Fowler did in that playoff um, and, and how he lost there. So that was a little bit tough. The Greenbrier, he and Robert Streb actually were both in a playoff and they were both eliminated to a birdie on the first hole. Um, it was a, a dessert classic in 2017. He lost to a birdie on the fourth extra hole. And this year at the RSM, he loses to a birdie on the second playoff hole. So, it, I mean, that's tough, but, but it teaches you a lesson. You got to make birdies in playoffs. Well, yeah. I wanted to, I wanted to add real fast to that. It was, it was amazing to watch the whole thing unfold, you know, from a, a fan's sort of a point of view for me, I was just on the couch, you know, flipping between football and, and golf and, when my team started going in the wrong direction, I flipped to the golf a bit more. And um, you, you you watch people sort of struggling their way through it, and you could see Streb didn't have the thing, yet he was still trying to play ag- aggressive. Didn't drive the ball awfully well, I thought. And then on 18, the first time, sort of whiffs one in the bunker and has nothing. And that up and down he had, I mean, that was incredible because that pitch shot, I don't think TV did it justice. But then when he smashes one and he hits it in the sweet spot the next time around, hits it over the top of those bunkers and has a wedge in his hand. And then he could go ahead and play aggressive. aggressive. And you kind of got the sense that from here, he was like, okay, I'm playing with house money right now. So I'm going to go ahead and ha- attack even from the rough. Cause you can hit a jet over the back of the green so quickly. It's the wedge in there nearly holes out. I mean, that would have been cool if you pulled that off. Yeah. I think, you know, one thing that I was thinking about as Greg was talking, and this is, this has little to do with the RSM because, uh, you know, Webb was in it, but he didn't play well, but, We've talked a lot about uh, Webb specifically over the last few weeks about 
uh, last week it was, okay, I got to, I got to play Augusta more conservatively. And this week it's, Hey, I got to play a playoff more aggressively, maybe more liberally. And I think that idea uh, just kind of, and, and Mark again has talked about this speaks to how long it takes to figure stuff out on the PGA tour. And um, I don't know that that has really nothing to do with necessarily Robert Streb or Kevin Kisner or anybody, but I just think that learning curve, we just, we, I think whenever we're talking about golf, we think it's just who has the most talent. And a lot of times it is most of the time it is, but that learning curve that can be worth a shot a week, two shots a week, three shots a week. Uh, I think that's a real thing. And, and maybe why you're seeing guys like DJ and Webb and some of these guys in their mid thirties have so much late career uh, success right now. They're banking up all that knowledge and it's coming certainly in handy gentlemen, in case you missed it last week, we're giving away a 55 inch smart TV. None of you are eligible, but everyone else is the contest is completely free to enter to win. Go to cbssportscom slash first cut giveaway. That link is in the description of the episode. If you're watching on YouTube, as well as in the podcast description on all podcasting platforms and the contest ends November 23rd. So if you're listening to this on the day that Robert Streb won, uh, it ends tomorrow. If you're listening to it yesterday, tomorrow, it ends today. Uh, gentlemen, Kevin Kisner. And Greg, I want to start with you on this because he is going to finish runner-up to Robert Streb. And we, we've kind of alluded to this a little bit. 0-5 in PGA Tour playoffs and eliminated with birdie all five times which doesn't really jive with Kevin Kistner, right? I mean, he's been so successful at the match play. Uh, a playoff situation turns, it, it turns into match play to be 0 for 5. I mean, it's just, this is a real big disconnect for me. Yeah, I understand what you're saying, but it's still, I guess it, it turns into match play in some sense, but a match play tournament, a match play round of 18 holes and a single hole in match play are often very different. You know, in, in a match play event, in a match play tournament, there's ebbs and flows and you can kind of get a feel for your opponent and what they're doing. There's more, much more strategy involved over a long haul. When you get to just one, one hole, it often feels like it's one hole. Might, maybe it's two it's just kind of a, uh, it's it's like a Monday qualifier, right? You just got to go out there, um, guns a blazing, and go at every flag. It's a it, it's a sudden death playoff for a reason. So, well, I understand what you're saying, but it's really difficult to go and make a, a birdie on the very first hole under that kind of pressure. So, uh, there may be something with his strategy. Uh, maybe it's a mindset, like we talked about earlier, for him, where he can figure out a way to get this done. But um, Boy, he is fun to watch when he gets under the gun, when he gets into contention, and when he feels like he has a chance to win. He's got that look in his eye they were talking about on the broadcast. He's just so intense. So I love watching him play. I expect his career, he's got three PGA Tour wins um, and uh, and the 0-5 record in the playoff. I I expect him to add uh, at least a couple more before his career is over. I think what's even weirder is just that a top – He's pretty consistently a top 50 guy, top 60, top 40, whatever you want, whatever bucket you want to put him in. Statistically, it's almost, it's weird to go 0 and 5, right? Like one of those, and I don't have all the guys that he lost to in front of him. I mean, he's, he's a better player than Robert Streb, and he's probably been better than uh, at least some of the other guys that he's been in a playoff with. So I think it's almost statistically weirder that he's 0 and 5 in playoffs than it is weird that somebody that we think of as a match play guy would, would have not won uh, kind of a, a, in a one-on-one setting. Yeah, even if they're all coin flips, like you would think that you can't lose five coin flips in a row at some point, but Kevin Kisner has. Uh, Mark, to Kisner's credit, I mean, he closed on Sunday with a bogey-free 63 to even get himself into this playoff. We know that Sea Island is a place he's had a ton of success. He's been in, he's won here. He's been in contention a whole bunch. So this is just more of Kevin Kisner, uh, you know, doing the same at a place that he loves, even if it doesn't end up maybe the way that that he would have liked. Yeah, it is. And just to build on the playoff observations real fast, uh, I think Greg made a very smart observation with the match play tournament sort of thing because they play there out in the Dawson Country Club and that sort of golf course. You'll see situations where guys stack birdies upon each other, but it's largely with those undulating greens where he won the match play. Um, 
it's a place where if you just stack piles it on top of someone, you're likely to come out there unbeaten. And then you just got to pick off birdies on, on the birdie yearbill holes. And, and that's what Kisner does. You know, all of my experiences with him, he's, he's, a, he's a grinding, sort of a gritty competitor. And everyone talks about the mindset, but he's the kind of guy who's never going to let you go. And if he gets to a golf course where um, he's comfortable, he clearly is comfortable around here because he likes to move it from right to left. And most of the holes turn from the right to left there. And, and then when they are going in the opposite direction, the wind is out of the left so he can hold his draw into that. So, so, so it's a really happy hunting ground for him. And I still don't know why on earth I didn't pick him in the one and done league because I was <laughs> dumb. But anyhow, um, the, the, the thing about Kisner around Sea Island is ever since he first saw it back in the SEC championship days playing for Georgia, he has been just a banshee around this place. And so when you come back to a golf course where you can read the greens comfortably, the golf course fits your eye off the tee, which is one of the keys to seaside because wherever you look, there's marshland and cross winds. But if you've got really good sight lines and you feel confident to put the ball in play off the tee, a number of the greens allow you then to play offense to, to some of them. So it, it's a question for a guy who wasn't really playing that great coming in here. It's just comfortability and, and he's pretty accurate. So if he's feeling comfortable, if he gets a chance to show off his short game, which he does around here too, around these greens that are perched up and they let you bump and runs and lob shots and stuff like that. It's playing into his uh, palette of weapons. So, so I, I'm certain and I won't make, make this mistake again next year. If Kisner's healthy, Kisner at uh, Sea Island is a thing. I think you've now got like uh, five or six tournaments already pre-aligned. If, yeah. if, Kis, if Kisner at Sea Island, Rory at East Lake, uh, Xander Webb at, somewhere. Webb, Webb at Wyndham. Uh, Webb at Wyndham. Yeah, okay. We, we, we know Mark's schedule. Um, real quick on this, Greg, because I, we'll, we'll put, put a bow on a conversation we had on Friday. Camilo Vigegas, he was obviously, you know, the rooting favorite of, uh, or the, yeah, of so many uh, this week, he's going to finish T6. His Saturday round of 70 was the one that got away from him a little bit in an event where scoring is so low. But we hope that uh, obviously he can continue this momentum from week to week and see how long you can keep it going. Absolutely. Um, so it was a strong finish for him. He'll be able to get into um, in, into Mayakoba now. So we'll have another opportunity to play uh, at another golf course that should fit him well. It's just on, he, he's, he was really close. I mean, he really could have won this tournament. He, the, the bogey at 13 was unfortunate. He, I believe it was 14 narrowly missed um, a, a birdie putt. And then he had a pretty good look for, uh, for Eagle on 15 that he missed and he, and he was forced to walk away with, uh, with, with just a birdie there. So he had a couple opportunities in that one to get really close to the lead and really challenge. Um, all in all, it was a good week. You could look to the second nine on Sunday as, as where the tournament kind of got away, but it was really more likely the second nine on Saturday, as you mentioned, Rick, where he added a couple under par, he shoots two under on that second nine. And, and this is a, a different day entering today. He, he shoots 37, on the second nine with two bogeys and, and ends up with a 70. You know, just to look at the physical element of it all, and I'm going to use the term statistically, believe it or not, you, you look at how the game is stacking together for him and, and uh, his approach play, I was so impressed watching some of the shots he hit into those greens. He was moving the flight. He was pretty good distance control wise. And, and, and he looked like the Camilo Villegas of old to me, who had won multiple events on the PGA Tour. He was pretty good off the tee, but he was a really stout iron player and he could gr uh, really scramble around the greens. And that stuff was working. If there's anything that to me was letting him down, I don't think he putted as well on some really pure greens. But the spiritual part of it, you know, sort of how I look at golf, you know, given what happened with Mia and just uh, what a hor horrific turn of events, you know, golf is a game of perspective and it's easy for a pro golfer, any golfer for that matter, but certainly pro that you can lose the perspective of the thing. And now with him having had Mia's passing in the rearview mirror, it seems to me like every round he plays, he's into that thing with a different kind of a perspective, whether it's good or bad or indifferent. You know, it's like he is almost thankful that he's competing and playing good golf. And I heard of an anecdote from a colleague of mine. We're in the driving range earlier last week, this week. Um, he saw a rainbow and he's like, Mia's watching or Mia's smiling, something to that sort of an effect. So, so right now he's got golf in its place and it's something Rory McIlroy has talked about. So I feel like the physical traits are there. And now that with some good play, he'll get a few starts and such. And with a mindset he's got going on, it's freewheeling. And so I expect a guy who is a confident sort of a player 
may start to build on this kind of stuff. Yeah, we're going to keep a close eye on him moving forward, and we're going to look ahead to the golf that we have on tap the next couple of weeks, and we will go through our matchups and one and done. But first, we're going to take a quick break and hear a word from our partners. And we're back. Turkey break time. So the PGA Tour taking a week off for Thanksgiving, but golf is not. We will get the match part three. That's Phil Mickelson, Charles Barkley versus Steph Curry and Peyton Manning. And then the following week will be the last event of the calendar year. It'll be Mayakoba. That field is shaping up to be pretty strong as of right now. Some of these guys might might opt out at some point, but Abe Answer in the field, Ricky Fowler, Tony Finau, Dustin Johnson still listed in the field. Brooks Kepka still listed in the field. We'll keep a close eye on them, KP. But uh, looking looking towards this, uh, give me an idea of your thoughts on on the world of golf for the next couple of weeks. Well, I think that uh, I think Peyton and Steph are going to kill Bill and Barkley. I mean, okay, <laughs> Peyton and Phil are like probably the same handicap right now. Right? Jesus, no! Um, wow. <laughs> so I actually, I think you're, I think you're doing a thing right now. But I actually thought they were like when this first came out. I was like, yeah, Steph and Peyton are the, are gonna kill them. I'm actually coming around that I think the others. I think I want, I think I want Charles and and uh, Phil. It, it does feel a little like suckerish, like <laughs> being so obvious. Uh, but yeah, no, that'll be fun. You know, my club is is interesting. I I hope DJ plays. That'd be fun. Uh, Ricky, I think, is interesting. He's not – I don't think he's qualified for the Masters next year. Oh, wow. Because I don't know how he would have – He's inside the top 50, isn't he? No, I don't think. Top 50 in the world? Mm, I can tell you in a second. It's pretty close if he is. When last I checked, I thought he was like 44 or something like that. He's 48. Yeah, they were 48. Close. So if, if he, he could fall out by the end of the year, I guess is, is sort of what I'm getting at. Um, Kyle, is that when the mark, when the cu- cutoff is end of the year? It's normally December 31. And then there's another one in two, uh, yeah. a week before. Right. Two weeks before. Yeah. Right. Um, so that's, that's pretty intriguing because we think of Fowler as kind of a mainstay at, at majors, obviously. Um, but he's, he's not been playing well. And, you know, thank God Steve won a match. <laughs> He 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 wouldn't be qualified either. <laughs> well, okay. To that, is he in the U.S. Open and such, Jordan? Yeah, he won. I mean, you get ten years after. You okay. Well, okay. How about the Open then? I mean, you get lifetime after you win that. Well, he oh, yeah, Trees won the Open. He's he's won. He's won yeah, yeah. That's the thing. <laughs> yeah, he's a want to make her away from a a career yeah. Grand Slam. I think you get into the PGA for like five years after winning the Open. So he's got he's got a few more years. Uh, so yeah, it, all that to say, like, my Coba, if the field holds, should be a lot of fun. If this field holds, Greg, uh, is DJ just going to be like five to one at my Coba after what he's done the last couple of weeks or months? Yeah, I mean, and, and he, he should be. Why, why would you – you can't take anything away from – the guy's played nothing but perfect golf for a while, and – with what he said after winning the Masters, it it leads you to believe that he's in a different place right now, and he's really motivated to finish strong. I, I, I got no sense that Dustin Johnson has like accomplished a goal and is going to go and and kick it back and relax for the remainder of his career. I, I think he's really trying to put ten more really hard years together and accomplish some things. So I, yeah, I, I think it'll be important to him. I think his form. Shows, of course, that he should be the favorite, and I think he will be. Have y'all seen his, his strokes gain number for the last three months? Uh, I think you dropped it on a pod the other day. Four point two. <laughs> oh, that's even better than I thought it was. And he's—it's not. I mean, he's playing only the best events. Right. Yeah, I, I saw he was ninety-two under par in his last seven events. Somebody brought is, this, somebody brought this up on Twitter, and it sounds. It sounds sacrilegious, but I think there's actually something in there that's truth or valid to it. Uh, but he was uh, Dylan Deshay, who works for Golf.com. He was talking about how he's like, "Is this the best golf that anybody? Is this but is this better golf than Tiger even played in 2000?" And I think that, like at the outset, you're like, "That's stupid. Like that's a dumb thing." Um, but then you start thinking about it, you're like, 
I don't know, golf's better now and DJ, you'd have to do it for a, a long, I think, I don't think he's done it for long enough to like really compare the, the, the tiger thing. But I do think that like, I mean, I, I, I almost feel like we're underrated how good he's been over the last three or four months. I'll say it's the best sense. It's the best other than that golf that tiger played, but t- tiger won seven events in a row. <laughs> and, and golf's, and I mean, golf, wait, wait a second. And golf's better now. I think VJ, Ernie, Phil, Retief, all of the there, there was the big six at that stage. I think they'll have something to say about that hot take of yours from your new shed. No, but but there's no there's no industry in in human civilization that's gotten less competitive when more money it, it gets poured into it. So it, it would be an outlier industry, like historically. I, I, I hear what you're saying, and I think those guys are. I mean, we were talking about the Masters. Ernie Els historically underrated. I think. I think he's. I think he's one of the best of all time. But if you look top to bottom, and, and this is kind of where you compare the strokes game thing. Like it's harder to gain strokes now than it was in 2000 because top to bottom golf is deeper and better than it was in 2000. It was better in 2000 than it was in 1990. It's just. It. it I mean, I, I don't think there's like a great argument against that. Oh yeah, okay. I, I sort of yeah that I still just find it sort of amusing when I I, I just want to see the guy's trophy, uh, his, his mantelpiece right now, and not necessarily look at the strokes gain number he's gaining every round of golf. I mean, the, the proof is in the pudding, and if you look at what he's got going on on the trophy cabinet, it, it's been ridiculous over the last few months. I was watching that Tiger chasing history thing the other night, and it stood out to me when, and I think it was Jim Nance on the call, Tiger had gone eight events in a row without winning, and he wins, and the the quote that Jim Nance said afterwards is, the drought is over. <laughs> like, could you, could you imagine an eight-tournament stretch being described as a drought for any person on the planet? Like, that's insane to me to think it, about. I, I think that... I don't know. DJ's, I, I don't know. I think oh, DJ. Kyle, I'm going to stop you from yourself here just for a minute because I love you, okay? You are the best one for just dropping this random Tiger nugget before a major championship going, hey, just to remind you, the Tiger went 6,723 days or whatever, just something crazy like that. And everyone else put together hasn't even achieved that sort of deal. And and, and now you are sort of arguing per up, but potentially DJ playing better golf than Tiger Woods did when he's in his prime? Yeah, I, I think I think that if you take the context of it, I think I think what Tiger did is both underrated and overrated. I think it's overrated because it wasn't against the type of competition that you're seeing now. But I think it's underrated because he changed the entire industry, right? Like he shifted the entire industry like by standard deviations so that it's 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 way better now, which is an unbelievable thing to do. Like nobody does that. Um, so I don't know. I think it's, I think it's interesting because if you contextualize what DJ is doing in this era, I think you could make an argument, uh, that he's playing as good a golf as Tiger ever did. Kyle Tiger did, did what he did across like three. I mean, it's the Tiger era, but it's almost like three different eras. I mean, he won a major in 97. He won as many as he did in the two thousands won a major in 2019 so it's like tiger hasn't didn't do this in one era against one group of players there was a a host of players that he did the game changed while he was playing it and he continued to dominate i mean there the years that he has that are dominant this dj run is great but it's almost it's almost like a normal stretch of of tiger tiger has a stretch like this in like four years there are four years you could find with a seven event streak like this for tiger woods it happens all the time help me remember what dj's won he won northern he won in boston he won northern trust correct yeah and then he, he he well you guys say you guys say he didn't win the tour championship uh, he did offici- not, offici- he did. <laughs> officially officially he did okay. he won he won the travelers uh-huh. I guess he just won the master. So four Must since the four. travelers. I know of one dude called Tiger Woods that won four majors, like on the spin. Remember that lot? Okay. The tiger slam. Okay. Just I'll, I'll, I'll stop with that. So, the, and, and I knew you guys would argue against me and that's fine. Cause I think it's an interesting argument. Um, I think the part where you get lost is in the argument is what Greg just said of like, show me the 2000 to 2008 run 
<laughs> which is, <laughs> it's a joke. And so you, you almost have to argue like a three month stretch or a six month stretch. You can't go, you, you can't take like cross sections of years and put them up against Tiger because nobody has done that. I'm arguing more of like a shorter time period. And I think if you look at the last three months of DJ gaining over four strokes on the best collection of golfers top to bottom in the history of the sport, it's a pretty legitimate thing. Any single one of those guys in the tour, you say to them, hey, I'm going to give you four tournament wins in the space of five months, or you can gain four strokes on the field and take <laughs> that as your accomplishment. Which one are you going to go with? Well, we're not tour players, though. We're, we're dissecting this stuff statistically and by wins and, and by all those different things. So, yeah. They do go hand in hand to some degree as well. Some degree. Right? I mean, you gain you gain that many strokes, and you end up with a lot of trophies, which which DJ has done both. I'm I'm gonna put a pin in this here. Sounds like great off season conversation we can have, and we'll go quick on the odds and ends because we got smoked this week. It was an absolute bloodbath out there. Uh, Kyle, with a two two and one record, you get to put on the matchup belt. Congrats. That's embarrassing. I should I don't even deserve it. <laughs> I mean, yeah, so many guys missed the cut. So many guys. Wins a win. You were competing against a weak field. I mean, this was like Tiger Woods. It feels <laughs> worth it. Strong when he was winning. This is like this is like the NFC East right here this week. This is like Tiger winning the 2001 PGA. It's like. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, our our one and done picks were not much better. Sung J M missed the cut. Mark zero. What was I thinking? You actually, I think you actually typed in. I I'm going to regret <laughs> this. Dot dot dot. Sung J M. I was I, I was I was vacillating between Harris, Kisner, and then I was sort of thinking along. Okay, who's the other Sea Island boys? Maybe I could spin someone. No, I'll go with Sung J. He's playing well. And I did this. I'm like, this is a bad idea. Uh, Greg and producer Jacob took Russell Henley for 39,553, which is peanuts in our one and done game. And then uh, Kyle and myself had Webb Simpson, 28,710. That's not going to get it done. The consolation for everyone is basically the same standings we had before the week. We're in the same exact spot. Hey, Webb's going to make more than that at the Wyndham Championship. I can promise you. (laughs) I I would uh, load up a lot of money on that, that he would for sure. Uh, Gentlemen. I thought that, uh, I thought Mark had to sit out because he kept picking the same guy for one and done. (laughs) Technically, he did. He took a zero. <laughs> Marquette, Marquette no, sung Jay for zero dollars. I think that's punishment. I, yeah, yeah. I, put, uh, I put myself in the penalty box last year because I picked Woodland twice by mistake. Well, it, it, honestly, now that we have the spreadsheet, now that producer Jacob actually shares our picks with us, this is going to be a lot easier to track moving forward. I was just firing in text messages of who I thought I had left and... That was how I was dealing with it. I think you picked Xander twice this season, Mark. No, I didn't. I think so. I haven't picked anyone twice. Mm, Jacob's spreadsheet says differently, but that's okay. We're going <laughs> to so figure it. Well, how am I supposed to pick folks if I can? <laughs> I agree. <laughs> I'm backing you on this. We're, we're just, we were just throwing out whoever we thought we had left. I completely agree, but we're all on the same page now. We're all good now. So where did I pick Xander twice? Help me now. US 2020, Open. yeah, U.S. Open and Zozo. Why didn't someone tell me when I text these things? Jeez. It's well, conspiracy. You got whatever. Hey, it's golf. You call your own penalties. <laughs> and, you, and you keep your own score. <laughs> uh, okay, right. I'm gonna ask you, I need a summary of who I've picked, please. This so is we, an incorrect scorecard that we have. We have, we have, it. <laughs> we have the link now, so we'll, we'll, we'll blast that out. Uh, gentlemen, happy Turkey Day. Enjoy a safe holiday. Uh, We're going to be back on Monday. I don't know if it's Monday, but we're coming back next week for a match three preview, which should be a lot of fun. Uh, uh, Probably on Tuesday is when that's going to drop. Uh, But until then, let me thank Greg Ducharme, who you can find at the real GFD. Let me thank Mark Immelman, who you can find at Mark underscore Immelman. And let me thank Kyle Porter, who you can find at Kyle Porter CBS. You can find me at Rick Run Good. This has been the first cut, and we'll catch you next time.